Hello everyone, I'm Marie Lamfrento, the CEO of the Global Infrastructure Hub. I'm delighted to welcome you to the launch of the Global Infrastructure Hub Certificate in Inclusive Infrastructure. Making inclusivity a baseline standard for infrastructure is critical. When infrastructure is truly inclusive, it allows all members of society to participate fully. Not only do people benefit as individuals, but they are significant benefits for broader society. Today, inclusivity in infrastructure can be a catalyst for economic growth in both developed and developing countries. And it supports sustainable development goals, as well as international conventions. Creating inclusion in infrastructure is everyone's responsibility, and we must address it from all angles. It's not just a macro issue. It deserves attention and action at a local and project level with strong commitment from governments as well as the private sector across the entire value chain. At the Global Infrastructure Hub, we've been researching best practice in inclusive infrastructure for some time. We identified several key elements of inclusivity that must be accounted for across all forms of infrastructure. And these form the basis of a certificate in inclusive infrastructure. Today, not only will you find out about this new professional training course, but we will also have a panel of experts from around the world with us. who are going to share their thoughts and experience of how inclusive infrastructure can drive social equity and sustainable development. I would like to thank these panel members for being with us and look forward to hearing what they have to say. I would also like to thank our partners, Teratza Zenef and Dr. Ibrahim O'Day, who have been an integral part of developing this program. And to everyone who has joined us, thank you for being with us today. I'm excited about the impact that a collective group of people from across the world can have. Together, we can make a difference. Thanks to our CEO, Marie Lamfrendo, for those words. And I note that Marie has been a very long time supporter of inclusivity in infrastructure. So thank you, Marie. Let's get straight into things. Uh, we have a lot to talk about. Uh, our first panel will be talking about inclusive infrastructure from the perspective of policy and community. Before we get started, though, some quick housekeeping. We will have two panels tonight. Uh, and we hope to have some time at the end of each panel for questions from the audience. Uh, could I ask that questions are posed using the chat function? And the question is if they prefer to direct the question to a specific panelist uh, and state their name and affiliation. So let's meet our first panel. Our first panelist is Teresa Nidella from the European Bank of Reconstruction and Development. Teresa is EBRD's principal economist and inclusive policy reform lead in Turkey. She has over 10 years experience uh, promoting gender equality and economic, economic inclusion through investment, having worked on project design, implementation and monitoring across multiple sectors and countries. She's also one of the lead authors of the EBRD's first Equality of Opportunity Strategy and its Strategy for the Promotion of Gender Equality 2021 to 2025. Welcome, Teresa. Our second panellist is Sharon Wakugu, CEO of InfraConnect Lot 15 and Lot 18 of the Kenyan Road Annuity Program, program uh, which is being undertaken by Motor Angle Africa. Sharon is passionate about people-first project development and transforming lives through accessible and sustainable infrastructure development. She brings over a decade of experience in infrastructure, which includes advising various corporations on large-scale projects in various sectors, including hospitality, healthcare, real estate, and road construction. Welcome to Sharon. And our third panelist is Dan O'Neill. Dan is lead specialist with DAI based out of the US. Dan has over 30 years of experience managing a wide range of infrastructure and capacity building projects. While much of his career has been spent in Haiti and the Dominican Republic, he has also managed projects in Togo, Guinea, Guinea-Bissau, Ethiopia, Vietnam, and Liberia. Uh, and he has built roads, schools, clinics, and water systems during that time. Welcome to Dan, Sharon, and Teresa. It is absolutely wonderful to have you all here. Let's get straight into things. Uh, to set the scene, I think, and to provide a bit of a definition for inclusive infrastructure, Teresa, 
my first question is to you. When we talk about inclusive infrastructure, people probably have a really broad range of things that come to mind. In its broadest sense, though, to give us some guide rails for the conversation tonight, how do you define inclusive infrastructure and with specific reference to what role infrastructure can play in economic and social inclusion? Thanks, Sam. Uh, nice to be here with everyone today. Um, we've already heard a little bit from Mary on this topic. And I mean, to me, inclusive infrastructure is really all about ensuring that infrastructure benefits the largest possible group of people, and specifically those that are traditionally underserved. So when we think about inclusive infrastructure, compared to maybe social infrastructure, which is traditionally schools, um, hospitals, maybe housing, with inclusive infrastructure, we are not just thinking about a specific class of infrastructure. Rather, we think about the different stages of the infrastructure process um, and about how we can reflect the economic and social inclusion considerations throughout those stages. So at the EBRD, this would mean we look at how do we plan, design, build, how do our clients operate and possibly even decommission infrastructure assets. Asking ourselves at every step of the process, how can we ensure and what can we do to ensure that the perspectives of all stakeholders are taken into account? Whether that's the people that use the infrastructure, whether that's the people that operate, the employees um, of, the, of the infrastructure uh, service provider, for instance, or anyone that is affected by the infrastructure in the community um, and the location where the infrastructure takes a project takes place. So obviously that comes with a high degree of complexity, having to identify, capture, and also reflect all these perspectives into uh, your respective stages of work. But thankfully, and, and I think that's a little bit the topic of today, there are many proven tested tools and mechanisms that can help us in this process. And I'm sure we're gonna hear about some of them today um, to actually make sure that we are aware of these perspectives and that we know what are the right and appropriate ways of reflecting them into the different stages of infrastructure. I think that's a great way to start. It really provides us a, a really broad definition of, of inclusive infrastructure um, and looks at it from its, from its broadest perspective. Um, I noticed you mentioned uh, the idea of the value chain. And um, my next question, um, Sharon, is for you. Um, you've had a lot of background in the PPP world, which you know deals with certain parts uh, of the value chain. So to, to bring that broad uh, sense now into the public-private partnership space, um, a lot of your work has been in Kenya. So can you give us an example of how the Kenyan government is working towards mainstreaming some of these inclusive principles uh, into infrastructure projects um, and especially PPP projects. Okay, um, thank you, Sam. Thanks again for having me and uh, good afternoon or good evening to everyone. Uh, so the Kenya government has done a lot uh, to mainstream inclusive principles and they've done this by number one, the promoting inclusivity in legislation and policies. Um, the other thing is by integrating inclusive practices across the project life cycle. So if we can look at uh, legislation and policies, for example, Kenya has a, quite a robust legal framework. So that makes it possible to, it makes it almost impossible rather, to implement a project that does not take um, inclusivity into consideration in one form or another. So at the top of this hierarchy, you have the constitution, which enshrines various inclusive principles such as gender equity, um, youth employment, or employment for people uh, living with disabilities, um, public participation um, or stakeholder engagement. Now these principles will then get trickled down into the applicable um, legislation and regulations that will impact on the various PPP projects. So for example, you have the Buy Kenya, Build Kenya policy, which deals with local content um, and the increase of um, consumption of locally manufactured goods and services. And then obviously you have the PPP Act, which um, governs um, all PPPs in the country. So um, aside from that, the other way is through integration of inclusivity principles um, throughout the project life cycle. So we can take an example. So in the project planning stage, for example, um, in Kenya, all projects must have feasibility studies. 
Um, and these studies must take into consideration the social, economic, and environmental impact of a potential project before they can be approved. Um, in the procurement stage, we have a fairly um, clear and open, transparent process, especially for competitive bids. I mean, there's still a lot to be done, but at least for competitive bids, it's quite clear and, and fairly transparent. And then in the construction stage, you find that project companies such as where I sit, we are required to regularly update the government on what we're doing in terms of youth employment, in terms of um, involvement of people with disabilities. And the good thing with this, um, as I've seen in my experience in both these projects and the, the previous ones I've been involved with, is it goes beyond just lip service because um, this monitoring and evaluation happens during the life, the life cycle um, of the project. Um, lastly, I think also capacity building has helped in mainstreaming. Um, and this has been done by mandating skills transfers. So you find that again, as project companies, we are obligated to show in a tangible manner how exactly um, we are transferring these skills to the youth, how we are um, transferring skills to the communities that are around, um, how we are sourcing or how we are capacity building um, the communities in the areas where the projects are involved. So in overall, um, by doing this or by including them into the project life cycle, it makes it tangible. And there's also some oversight on contractors such as ourselves um, in ensuring that these inclusive principles are not just theoretical, but they're actually implemented um, on the ground. Yeah, I, I think what's coming through already quite strongly, I'm sure there's a lot of things that we'll return to um, over the next uh, 45 minutes or so, but that idea of real integration into the whole life cycle um, of, of infrastructure, I think that's something that's coming through really strongly already. Um, I want to now turn to, to Dan and to talk again, to really kind of give substance this idea, to this idea that this is a really broad kind of way of looking at inclusive infrastructure. And Dan... You were um, instrumental in drafting the USAID toolkit, um, Building a Better World, Integrating Gender-Based Violence Prevention into USAID Energy and Infrastructure Projects. Um, so again, that, that is again sort of a really sort of a, a broadening of the, the theme that we're looking at. Can you give us a bit of insight into how infrastructure projects can, can play a role in, for instance, preventing gender-based violence? Thanks, Sam. I think the key thing we need to keep in mind here is that well-designed infrastructure can make the world a safer place in the same way that badly designed infrastructure can make it more dangerous. I'm a civil engineer. I know that when I'm designing a building, there's formulas that tell me how much steel to put in a column to make that building safe, right? But just as we wouldn't deliberately reduce the amount of steel we put into a column, we can't skimp on the steps that are required to make our infrastructure safe for women and for vulnerable groups. I'll walk you through three quick examples. Bathrooms. Bathrooms is always a hot topic. You're building a school in a rural area. You want to build bathrooms that are safe for, for everyone to use. You want them to be in a private location. Nobody wants to be watched as they go to a bathroom, but you can't put them in an isolated area where people could be attacked on their way in or out. It's a tricky balance. But it's not just about rural schools. In the United States, we're having this debate now. Can a transgender person use a woman's restroom. It's a tricky political debate, but as a civil engineer, we can get around this by making a bathrooms that are gender neutral, that has stalls that come all the way down that anyone could be safe using. Sample two, hallways and pedestrian tunnels. Women's vulnerable groups, they're safer in well-lit spaces. We need to avoid building long dark tunnels and hidden areas. For example, my old office in Virginia, the metro stop was on the other side of a busy street. So people built a tunnel to go under that busy street. That makes things safer, right? Except the tunnel went down a stairway, it bent left, it bent right, it bent right again. And with all those hidden corners, none of the women in my office felt safe using that tunnel, badly designed. And the third one, is when we're just building infrastructure sites. Now, donors frequently require a significant percentage of women on the sites. 
That's a good idea, but only if there's bathroom facilities and other facilities to make it safe for the women to be there. So they're not feeling threatened when they're going to and from work. When we build infrastructure, we know that infrastructure can last 50 years or longer. We need to make sure that we're building a world that helps keep everyone safe. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. And yeah, I, I think it's constantly uh, shocking um, when you look at some infrastructure design, how, how how too uh, too often some of these considerations aren't taken into place when in many cases the solutions could be quite simple um, to make the infrastructure so much more usable uh, for everyone. Uh, I'll just remind everyone as well in the audience, uh, feel free to start putting questions in the chat. We've got another round of questions for our panellists, but then we will have some time to throw to you. Uh, we, there are quite a few of you online, so, so please do uh, feel free to ask some questions of your own. Um, Therese, I'm going to return to you now and picking up on something that Sharon mentioned from the PPP space, talking about uh, particularly that idea of using inclusive procurement um, as a key tool. We know it's a key tool for driving social and economic inclusion, uh, but how can this be applied to the infrastructure sector? Yeah, so indeed, procurement is a major part of infrastructure delivery. And we know globally that uh, public procurement has, has reached around 13 trillion US dollar on an annual basis. So if we find a way um, in, I mean, with this huge sum, if we find a way to maximize its positive inclusion outcomes, we could actually go a long way towards achieving the SDGs, which we also know um, we're still a, a, a fair way uh, away. And so it seems like we're leaving impact on the table if we don't ask ourselves of how these $13 trillion each year can also promote inclusion outcomes. So the way in which we at the EBRD leverage the power of procurement is by integrating additional inclusion focused activities as part of contractors mandatory scope of work. And that's a little bit uh, to the point that Sharon has already mentioned. Um, by integrating these components, we can, for instance, uh, encourage contractors to offer on the job training for job seekers for other underserved groups. Um, we can also use the procurement process to promote the adoption of equal opportunities action plans. So this is about uh, increasing contractors workforce diversity, whether that's in terms of gender or other forms of diversity. And Daniel has, has mentioned an important point as well. Of course, these, these action plans, they're not only about increasing the presence of women on site, but they also about making sure that women are safe and, um, and supported in taking up these opportunities. So they may also include um, aspects such as HIV/AIDS prevention, but also childcare which we know um, is, of course, a, a, a huge barrier to women's labor force participation in many of the countries where we work. Now, as also I think uh, Sharon spoke briefly about it, we still see um, problems in many of the countries where we work with the competitive procurement uh, processes. Um, they're not always as, as open or as transparent as we would like them to, to be. So what's important about introducing uh, inclusion requirements is we don't want them to be a reason for, for, for moving back on some of the uh, principles of procurement that we have sort of like fought hard and long for, for establishing. So how we uh, manage to balance these two uh, points on, on the side of the EBRD, we make these interventions on inclusion a mandatory part um, of contractors' work. So instead of them becoming part of the evaluation of contracts, we actually encur encourage them as part of the mandatory scope of work. Um, so that enables us to do such interventions, but still stay in line with IFI procurement rules. While at the same time, creating this uh, impetus for contractors to adopt new practices. And we see that these are effects are not just sort of short lasting for the project that we as an, as an international financial institution are funding. And that's because they really in the end are all about addressing business challenges. So when we're thinking about a private sector contractor, especially in the construction sector, one of the key reasons for project um, delays and relatedly cost overruns is actually sort of issues about um, workforce. And if we manage to encourage contractors through the procurement process to consider and tap 
into some of these um, underserved or under uh, underutilized aspects of the labor market, whether that's women or that is people um, that are not in employment or training at the moment. And we enable contractors to equip these people with the right skills to become active in, in their respective sector. We are actually helping them build a qualified talent pool that they can then draw upon to um, address their workforce challenges. So I think it's one of those examples that really shows that um, integrating inclusion considerations into infrastructure um, delivery is not just the right thing to do, it's also the smart thing to do because it enables us to really address the business challenges that um, that the sector is facing as well. Yeah, it's a great point, Teresa. And I think a lot of the points around inclusive, uh, sorry, um, inclusive procurement, uh, I think a lot of it is almost uh, goes to this idea of creating an alignment in values between um, you know the procurer and and those who are contracting in. It, it actually then brings me to my next question, which is uh, for Sharon. You know, so much of infrastructure is about partnerships between two different organisations, whether it's a contractor and a government uh, or, or MDBs and others. You know, everything is about creating um, a, a partnership between, you know, two or more counterparties, I think. Uh, and we've heard about some of the tools and the ways in which you can do that. But, Sean, I wanted to ask you, how important is it that project proponents are basically able to demonstrate shared value around gender and inclusion um, to to their counterparties and to other groups like potential investors? Uh, I think it's really important. And like Teresa said, it's like she was in my head. <laughs> I, I agree with a lot of her points. It's extremely important that uh, project proponents demonstrate these shared values around inclusion because, um, as she mentioned, it's, what, $13 trillion or, or so? It's now evident or it's understood that infrastructure is one of the biggest catalysts for development. Therefore, valuing and promoting inclusivity has almost become um, an ethical imperative and it's one of the key considerations, especially for investors. So if you're looking at it from a government standpoint, for example, as a contracting authority or stakeholder, they have to be cognizant that, for example, multilateral finance institutions like MIGA and the rest, they'll always consider gender, social and environmental impacts when assessing projects. So it's important or it's, um, it's necessary for these government stakeholders to then demonstrate these shared values because then they're more likely to receive the support from the MFIs and as a result, the governments or the contracting authorities will be able to present projects that are more attractive to ourselves in the private sector and to investors. Um, but aside from that, I think overall, the reason why it's important um, for all project proponents um, to demonstrate inclusivity or to an understanding of inclusivity is for the success of the projects themselves. Um, there's enough data to support the fact that socially inclusive projects are often more stable because they're able to foster relationships with communities um, and stakeholders, and therefore they'll reduce the likelihood of disputes, uh, protests or disruptions, which for myself from the private sector, you're looking at how will you ultimately safeguard that investment. Um, and on the flip side, where you have projects that either don't get the social license or don't get buy-in, um, they face operational challenges or resistance. And then ultimately what that leads to is a higher cost. You have time delays on the project. So everybody sort of suffers if we fail to take note of these um, inclusive principles. So as a whole, I would say the industry is trending towards inclusion being the norm. So it's become imperative for all project proponents um, to share these values and to understand um, and prioritize inclusivity for the benefit both of the project and also for all the stakeholders um, involved. Yeah, I think that's the way that you put it, that, that ascribing a, a real value to it, um, talking about projects being more stable, I think is a really, really good point. Probably something that's often overlooked. And it, there's actually a question that's come in from the audience, which I'll ask shortly, but uh, Dan, which will goes to that a little bit as well. Um, but then uh, it's, a, it's a similar question to that last one um, for Sharon. And it's going to that idea from an aid funding perspective. Um, how important is it for, for infrastructure projects in that context to be able to demonstrate that they reflect the values of donor countries with regards to gender and social inclusion? I'm going to say it's a tricky balance. 
right? On one hand, if a donor is building, let's say a multi-story school in an earthquake prone country, and that country has an old out of date building code, the donor should of course require the school be built to modern safety standards. They shouldn't build a building that's gonna collapse. In that same way, if the donor, donor should not fund spaces that are unsafe for women, no dark windy hallways, no bathrooms in isolated locations. The tricky part is that the donor should be talking about a shared culture and not imposing their culture. I talked earlier about gender neutral bathrooms. That might not be an appropriate solution in every instance. The trick with this is we're talking about what trillions of dollars of infrastructure being built every year and infrastructure that's gonna last 50 years or longer. We wanna make sure we're building a safer world for all. Thank you. Um, thanks, Dan. And this, some of the questions that have been raised actually, there's been a really interesting um, question and I wanna um, give all of our, our panelists an opportunity to answer this because it is something that gets raised a lot and I'll read it's from Nufi and apologize if I'm uh, pronouncing that incorrectly. Um, but the question is in a situation whereby inclusivity makes a potential project costlier and unviable to attract investors, uh, how do we mitigate this circumstance? So, Teresa, I'll, I'll start with you and, and we'll go through the rest of the panel because I'd love to hear everyone's answers to this. Actually, I mean, I hear this concern a lot, but in our experience at the EBRD, this is actually not necessarily what we see uh, reflected in projects in, in reality. So just to give an idea, like um, these interventions that promote uh, the integration of underserved groups in the workforce of contractors, usually the sort of additional cost that this adds to a project is less than 1% of the overall contract value that the respective contractor is accessing with that uh, commitment to inclusion. So um, in, in our experience, this hasn't necessarily been a barrier to, uh, uh, to investments um, bankability, actually quite the opposite. I mean, understanding, for instance, from a user perspective, how infrastructure can really serve the largest possible groups of users. And maybe transport is a good a good example here. If, if transport systems aren't built, um, for instance, with strong considerations of gender-based violence and harassment risks, you risk having only half of the population actually using public transport. So from a bankability perspective, actually um, demonstrating that a project takes into account inclusion uh, may, may actually contribute to making it um, bankable and, and financially uh, attractive for investors. It's Teresa, and, and Sharon, what are your thoughts on that? Um, I actually find that this it's a... Uh... It's a perception that's really pervasive, especially from my side in the in the uh, as the private sector. But a lot of times, what we end up seeing is that the project costs go up because this hadn't been thought about from before. So obviously, now at that point, you're looking at the project not um, offering or delivering value for money because now you have um, this is a particular set of people who need to uh, be included or their needs need to be taken into consideration, which then might result in a change of design at a very inopportune moment. You know, the project has already commenced or whatever, or you find um, companies like we're consistently being asked to do or undertake CSR projects. And some of them are really huge. It's not CSR, it's almost an entirely new um, project happening. So when you then have people speaking and giving their experience from this part of it, it looks like it's the inclusivity that has resulted in the increasing cost, whereas it's more a planning issue rather than inclusivity um, on its own. Yeah, no, that, that's a great point. Uh, and Daniel, uh, any, any last thoughts on that? Remember my story of the tunnel going under the road? I'll bet someone on that design panel said, this is a bad idea. We need a straight tunnel. And someone else said, no, that would make it too expensive. So they built a bad tunnel that nobody uses. Well, I think I think that pretty much says, says it all. Um, and, and I completely agree. Certainly our experience here at the Hub has been that um, that's probably a risk that, to Sharon's point, I, I would suggest in many cases is, is almost more about perception than, than how it actually plays out. Um, unfortunately, uh, we that's all the time for we have with our first panel. I do know there's a question there um, about indicators um, uh, of inclusivity impacts, and I'll just I'll ask uh, Martha who wrote that in. Uh, we'll be addressing that in our next panel. So 
uh, feel free to revisit that with us uh, shortly. Um, thank you, Teresa, Dan and Sharon for some wonderful insights uh, and please stay with us uh, for the remainder of the session. We'll be uh, moving on to the next panel shortly. Uh, now, one of the reasons for tonight's event, as uh, our CEO, Marie, mentioned, is to launch the GI Hub's Certificate in Inclusive Infrastructure. Um, and globally, and I think, you know, as we saw, you know, coming through um, in that panel, there was a lot of talk around things like capacity building. So there's a need for more capability and more capacity uh, to develop inclusive infrastructure so that it delivers social equity and economic inclusion, both within and across communities. Uh, the, the Certificate in Inclusive Infrastructure, it's a practical course. Uh, it's available now to infrastructure professionals. Working in government and the private sector, uh, as well as international development organisations uh, and nonprofits as well. And you can find out more uh, and enrol on the web address on the screen there, infrastructureforall.org. So please uh, search for that if you are interested in undertaking that course, which is available from now. Uh, the other thing I wanted to mention before we introduce our second panel. Uh, I want to acknowledge our illustrator, the incredibly talented uh, Kat Leach from Catfish Creative. And you can see uh, up there, um, she has been putting our words into pictures as we go. Uh, and we'll be actually releasing Kat's work uh, after this event on our social media, which will be a bit of a, a visual reminder of a lot of the themes that we've been covering today. So thank you to Kat uh, and watch this space. Introducing our second panel now. Uh, our first panellist is Emily King. Emily is Global Principal of Social Value and Equity Advisory at Jacobs. Uh, together with Jacobs' global team of practitioners, Emily employs innovative frameworks and techniques to better understand community needs and help clients evaluate and optimise social value. Uh, she works closely with Jacobs' strategic partner, Symmetrica Jacobs, and they devise innovative solutions incorporating social value measurement and wellbeing valuation into long-term investment strategy and planning. So welcome, Emily. Uh, our second panelist is Claire Sharamnak. Claire is a social development specialist uh, in gender and development at the Asian Development Bank with over a decade of experience in gender mainstreaming and implementing programs with a focus on women and girls uh, for organizations, including the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, uh, the World Bank Group and Catholic Relief Services in Asia and the Pacific. She is also the co-founder of Women Lead, uh, a leadership development organisation for young women in Nepal and has authored several research publications on this issue. So welcome to Claire. Uh, and our third panellist is Ziad Husami. Uh, Ziad co-founded Maruna, a Lebanese startup dedicated to transforming the country's dire uh, sanitation infrastructure into a decentralised and circular model. Maruna is a transliteration of the Arabic word for resilience. Uh, and in 2020, uh, the GI Hub, that's us, was very happy to uh, crown Maruna the global winner of its first Infra Challenge competition from Maruna's nature-based product Biome Web. And Maruna then went on to invest the prize money in a local manufacturing facility and is now delivering uh, systems to informal settlements in Lebanon and master plan communities in the United Arab Emirates. So welcome Ziad, welcome Emily, and welcome Claire. It is wonderful to have you with us for our second panel. Um, now, a few people actually mentioned uh, economics in the chat, so we, we might get a, a chance to go to some of those questions. So let's start with a, a question that does touch on economics uh, for you, Emily. E economic and cost benefit analysis, uh, sorry, economic appraisal and cost benefit analysis. They've, They've been the tools that we've traditionally used to select uh, infrastructure projects for funding for forever, basically. Um, but given some of the things that we're talking about here, are these still sufficient for a necessarily holistic view of the full social value of our investment decisions? Yeah, thanks, Sam. Um... I mean, like you say, you know, economic appraisal has been around for quite a while. It's extremely well established. We've got some, you know, brilliant economists um, in, in Jacobs and, and beyond. And I think, yes, you know, the models that we've got, they can provide a holistic view. But I think we just need to be careful that we don't rely on too much of a narrow range of indicators. So, you know, we need to really augment perhaps some traditional methods that have focused just on economic and financial indicators, you know, say jobs and, and GVA, 
So, you know, I think we can really augment this. And if we think about communities and neighborhoods and, and the outcomes we want to see, like community cohesion and um, strong kind of physical and mental health within our communities and a wide range of environmental outcomes, for example. So, you know, perhaps not just focusing on, on carbon, um, um, but thinking about, you know, biodiversity, the cultural environment, the historic environment, all of these different indicators that create value for society. In the UK, we're quite lucky because we have government guidance on this. So we have a, a well-being approach that the, the UK government supports. There's, there's guidance available from, from our treasury. And this brings in um, a concept of quality of life. Um, so it's all about understanding how investment, infrastructure investment drives well-being. And, and through this, we can evaluate a really wide range of social um, costs and benefits. Um, we also have uh, a tool, an equity and inclusion tool called uh, distributional impact appraisal. Again, UK guidance on this. It sits alongside the business case. So when you look at the distribution of costs and benefits, it's not just about the size of the of the pie that you're making, it's how that pie is divided up. So doing distributional impact appraisal allows us to focus on low income groups, for example, and, and historically underserved neighborhoods and to try and redirect investment to um, create opportunity um, for, for those underserved um, communities. So this distributional approach, it's it's just been adopted in Australia, which is really positive to see. So it's it's based on UK guidance, but it adopted for and adapted for, for Australia. And we're also starting to bring this kind of this method, this distributional approach into our equity analysis in the Americas. So I'm applying it on projects in um, Vancouver, for example, and, and state of Georgia. So I think there are other tools in our arsenal. You know, we also have environmental impact assessment for the planning and consenting process. We have a qualities assessment, health impact assessment. So there's a whole gamut of different frameworks um, that we can bring to supplement um, cost benefit analysis. And I think the most important thing is understanding when to deploy, which method, um, when to integrate it into the business case or whether it's something that's in introduced a different point in the project to to really drive those outcomes that we want to see. Yeah, there's, there's some great points there, and I think there's a much broader suite of tools um, uh, that we should definitely start using. And it's kind of extraordinary that well-being is something that we all look for in our lives, but that we don't try to include it in our infrastructure projects. Um, and I think it sort of sits in some of these themes that we should really be sort of widening our gaze in terms of how we look at the, the whole sector and, and what we can do, what we can achieve with infrastructure. Um, Claire, a question for you now, and it, it harks back a little bit. We've been talking a lot so far about how this involves the whole value chain and, and how like this, a lot of these themes and, and, and ideas should be, you know, integrated all the way through um, the infrastructure value chain. Uh, and I know that the Asian Development Bank, uh, they've demonstrated a strong commitment to integrating uh, a gender lens and also social and economic inclusion in their projects. So how important is it to really have that full integration of these considerations into projects so that we're really, we're moving beyond good intentions, which I think, you know, so many people in the sector have, but moving beyond good intentions to action. Thanks, Sam. And I think, you know, everyone has talked about this today, but um, in order to make infrastructure work for everyone, we know there needs to be a critical shift in the way that it is designed, delivered, and managed. And unfortunately, too often, design of infrastructure projects and services don't consider or rarely consider women's preferences and needs. And I think Dan had quite a uh, few good examples there concretely of that. Um, we also see that women are, are largely underrepresented in infrastructure sector agencies and often their voices aren't heard in policy and planning processes. So really in order to hone in on that and to start addressing that, I think you mentioned um, you know, how we do that and I'm gonna kind of take it from the higher le lens view to, the, to really the project nitty gritty. Um, accelerating progress in gender equality is one of our seven operation priorities in our strategy 2030. And really what that means is that we understand that we can't achieve a prosperous, inclusive, resilient um, Asia and Pacific without addressing gender equality. Um, and there's five specific, um, areas that we look at, and those areas all link our core to infrastructure as well in terms of women's economic empowerment, 
um, looking at health and education, um, decision making and leadership, uh, time poverty reduction, and resilience to external shocks. So again, the time poverty piece, uh, Teresa mentioned this earlier, very importantly thinking about care, right? Um, but what that actually, and this is all big strategy, what that actually means in projects for us in our gender mainstreaming approach is that we have a process which focuses on um, design, the process I mentioned, and outcomes. And it's really critical to have that process in place in order to address gender gaps in, this, in the sector. Um, so in recent years, we've drastically improved our gender mainstreaming um, efforts. And about 90% of our infrastructure projects are categorized as gender inclusive. Now, what do I mean by gender inclusive? And again, I think it's important we really drill down as to what these terms actually mean, right? Um, so we have a four-tier gender mainstreaming um, categorization. And when I say gender inclusive, the top two, which is effective gender mainstreaming and gender equity projects are the ones that fall under this 90% umbrella. Now, again, breaking it down further, what does it mean to have effective gender mainstreaming? And I think we talked about this a little bit in the, in the first panel. Um, it's having robust gender analysis in these different sectors, right? It's having human resources, financial resources dedicated, not only to gender analysis, but also to having specialists in, um, in the government agencies, in the projects that we're working on to continue through implementation. Um, it's having a gender action plan. Um, and then finally, a very, very critical part in going into outcomes and measurement. For us, it's ensuring that all of our projects that are in those two categories, more than 50% of our project outputs need to have a gender performance indicator. And again, what does that mean? That's closing gender gaps or narrowing gender gaps. That's addressing women's empowerment in that sector. Um, so I bring up the process because it's not always the most interesting thing to know how the sausage is made, but actually that's how we get to the outcomes that we want, right? And really this process enables us to identify entry points and in infrastructure. Again, I think we started talking about to address gender and social inclusion. Um, entry points such as accessibility, affordability, policy reform, um, women's employment, um, women's safety and security, and also looking at gender and disability. So again, I think it's important to talk a little bit about the process, um, and then I'm happy to, to talk a bit later of what does that actually mean concretely in terms of outcomes and, and what we see have made a difference uh, in our projects. I think I think that's a really good point. The idea of of process being a starting point. So, and we will revisit that uh, very shortly. Um, is but Ziad, I'll, I'll turn to Ziad now. Um, one of the things that we've we've all the our other speakers so far have tended to come from bigger organisations, um, and, and we've talked a lot about how they're driving change. And um, there's some really interesting thoughts there. But I think it's really interesting, I'd, and I'd love to hear about how can a startup drive change in inclusive infrastructure, and perhaps more importantly, um, what needs to change systemically to actually support startups to be able to play this role more? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. I think uh, large organizations definitely have, you know, a role, and these are huge problems. And, um, you know, I think, though, that we as startups have an advantage that we get to be more agile and we get to be more creative. Um, and even though, you know, some of these big organizations have massive budgets, uh, we get to the point where sometimes, you know, in the example of Lebanon, where there are some organizations that have built, you know, almost tens of wastewater treatment systems throughout the country, and almost none of them are in operation today. And so, you know, there is a um, there is a tendency in in this in this sector to continue with with business as usual. And so, sort of the game is is um, kind of stacked against us as startups. And we don't really make it. We don't make the cut to get and in, to get into the game and play with the projects. And that's definitely not to say that the people that work in these organizations don't want something to change or to work differently. Um, you know, so for example, I've been in situations where we're applying to projects, and I was there's this guy, and I was like, I hate this guy, and he's it's because of him, and he's not letting us in. We're not getting in because you know it's personal. And we sit in front of him in the room and he says, oh, I love what you guys are doing. I loved your proposals and, and these are great, but we can't support you because, you know, it doesn't meet these type of requirements. And if we go on on a limb, this will hurt us in the future. So, you know, the role of startups, I think for us is, you know, 
we got to look at ways of doing things differently. And we work in the sanitation field. So, um, you know, I, I use this example. Uh, Pliny the Elder called the Clauco Maxima Rome's greatest architectural achievement. And that is an ancient sewer, which is remarkably still in use today. And what is more remarkable is that we continue to use the same strategies. And that might have been okay when Rome's population was in the thousands, but you know, today's environment that leads to problems. And that means we're not using our resources perhaps as effectively as we can. And I think as as startups and as the GI Hub has has successfully done, I think with us, is that at least we can at the small scale show how we can do things differently under the noses of the people that can then pick it up and run with it. And you know, we have with help assistance from the Bill and Gates Foundation as well. We've done innovations in the informal settlements. We've sandboxed and we've allowed you know others to say to point at that and be like, you know what, we can take that and we can scale it. And we have even taken that across from the development field all the way to the master plan luxury communities in the UAE as well. Thanks, Zayed. And one of the things that actually strikes me is, um, you know, when, when you talk to people in the sector, uh, there's kind of a an acknowledgement, say, around sustainability and infrastructure. You know, there's a really strong acknowledgement that more innovation is needed and, and new ways of doing things. But I feel like when you put inclusivity and, and sustainability side by side, the conversation's a, a little bit behind, I guess, in, inclus in terms of inclusivity. So probably still playing catch up, I guess, in some ways um, to kind of make that case for more innovation um, and, and more flexibility around things. Yeah, I think, you know, when we look at infrastructure, we're looking at, um, you know, people think big infrastructure just brings the term massive, big concrete and, 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 you know what, we can actually think about, you know, decentralized nimble and agility and infrastructure where you can take it to the people in the communities where they can actually decide, you know, and think big by thinking small. That's actually, uh, it's a really good, um, you know, talking about, you know, how, how things can change within the sector. Um, it's a good segue into my next question for you, Emily. And, and I wanted to talk about, um, you know, we spoke about, uh, you know, there is um, a potentially a need to sort of have a broader lens in terms of the tools that we can use to assess projects. Um, but I'd be interested in hearing how of prevailing views of including things like social benefit in some of these assessments how have they changed over time um, in your experience and and how much more change needs to occur? Yeah, thanks, Sam. I mean, I think most people that consider themselves like a social benefit or social equity, social value practitioner would agree that, um, yeah, we've been on a bit of a journey. Um, we are um, more in demand. Um, you know, it wasn't that long ago that I was... Uh, a humble uh, socio-economist working just on, on UK projects and, and I've had this fantastic opportunity at Jacobs to have a global role and to kind of respond to this global demand for more um, quantitative assessment um, in the field of social value. So I think we're on a good trajectory um, and, you know, this this new professional training course that GIH is offering and the opportunity to get, you know, certified in inclusive infrastructure, this is all kind of brilliant on that that trajectory. I think historically we may have relied too heavily on um, procurement and supply chain to really create benefit and, and 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 inclusion outcomes. You know, it's not to say that that kind of work of implementing tangible outcomes on the ground, you know, is incredibly important and valuable. Like you know, Sharon has talked about youth employment and skills transfer. That's already all really important and valuable work. I guess where where I, I come in and the work that I'm trying to do, it's more about using quantitative social value evaluations to inform upfront decision making. So even going as far forward as influencing, you know, which investments to make in the first place. So, you know, we really want to understand um, which investments to make and importantly, um, where we want these benefits to accrue within society based on the greatest needs. So you know, take, for example, you know, a major hospital refurbishment, that's going to be an extremely expensive project or program. And, you know, do we do we understand, have we done the quantitative, quantitative analysis to understand whether that's going to meet community needs? Or could we assess, for example, a localised community-based program? Perhaps that could be more effective in creating 
the benefit for society that we that we want to see so um yeah I think that's where I'm at I think you know that kind of upfront piece that upfront decision making really starting to understand how our investments play out for society before before we're putting a spade in the ground um yeah so I guess that's that's my own personal mission that's where I'm um trying to persuade clients and colleagues and Jacobs to to harness this capability at the earliest um, decision making points in in the infrastructure life cycle and and I think there's more and more um uh, you know interest uh, and desire to see some of those kind of concepts coming through and particularly that idea around optioneering different ways of looking at things um you know um, the sector's been very guilty in the past of saying um the the solutions are road not um the, the solution is we need to get people to a certain place and you know we sort of put the cart before the horse sometimes so I think I think that's a really good point. Um, and that idea of um, improving how we actually uh, assess things, Claire, this kind of goes back to the, the point we were talking about earlier. Um, measuring impact is obviously, you know, we, we talked about process and how that then leads to output and impact. Measuring impact is obviously an incredibly important part uh, of making better decisions. Obviously, it tells us what works and what doesn't. Um, so what does better impact measurement mean in practice? How, how do we make this real? You know, I think this is a very uh, kind of new ground for multilaterals, right? I think that a lot of time um, and effort has been put into thinking through strong gender design, social inclusion design um, for projects. And we're only now kind of looking at, okay, it, we have to get to the next step of being able to actually measure this and see what works and what doesn't work. Um, so for ADB itself, um, we've had very recent guidelines. It's only been since 2022 for measuring a project's gender performance and development impact at project exit. So we set a target. We said, you know, 80% of completed projects need to deliver intended project results. Again, what does that mean? Um, tangibly, that means 80% of the activities we commit to and plan need to have been implemented and completed. Um, and 80% of the gender targets that we have set in that plan need to be met. Um, so I, I think that's where we start seeing exactly where are we having it enables us to see where are we having difficulty in which targets are we having difficulty in meeting, right? What activities are difficult for us to see? So it's still too early for me to be able to say exactly what those are, but we need to have that system in place in order to go back and understand what works and doesn't work. I will say just from looking at, you know, the projects we've had in place over the last few years, um, again, we've talked about this um, already throughout this panel, but, you know, looking at women-friendly physical design and spaces and increasing women's leadership and infrastructure are very, very critical in achieving impact, right? And, and also the piece of women's employment, I think what is critical is to think through how women can have skilled jobs, um, have, te have technical jobs, right? I think in the early stages of when we were looking at this, um, it was important to get women into infrastructure, but I think there was maybe more of an emphasis on low-skilled jobs, which again, is an important, you know, getting onto that first ladder but us understanding that, of course, there's so much opportunity for women to be able to take on these skilled jobs. So we're seeing that more and more, and that's actually um, what we try and try to require, essentially, is to say, if we are increasing jobs in a certain project or sector, how do we make sure that women are you know, able to access opportunities for skilled jobs? Um, and then finally, of course, you know, looking at implementing policy reforms, and, and you know, one of the ones I've mentioned is looking at affordability of transport services, right, and how that impacts women and vulnerable groups differently. Um, so I think for us, when we're looking at like, what is the future of um, gender inclusive infrastructure projects? Like where are we going to go and how can we make sure we have a greater impact? I think, you know, we were at that stage where we see that we've hit these targets. We know how to do literally in the category effective gender mainstreaming, but we are having to get to what does it actually mean to close these gender gaps that in social inclusion gaps? And um, how can we really support and put women's empowerment at the core of what we're doing. Um, and that's where we really see the breakdown. I think I mentioned, you know, vast majority of projects are at that stage and we want to move them about 10% are at that, what we consider to be gender transformative, right? Really looking at a transformative agenda for gender equality, which is in the UN Sustainable Development Goal 5, right? Which says, we're looking at more systemic issues. We're looking at addressing gender-based violence. We're looking at care, right? And how do we do that through all of our different projects? Um, so I just want to end by saying, you know, that's where we're trying to go. And, and um, you know, there's a specific, I like to use kind of specific project in mind when we think about these are the projects we want to make sure that we're doing. And so there was a project we had um, on uh, the rapid bus transit in Karachi in Pakistan, 
And when we were looking, as I said, all these different things, how does this come together into a project, right? Well, it's looking at separate queuing facilities for women and men, marked priority seatings for people with disabilities. Um, we mentioned separate restrooms with diaper changing facilities, lighting, CCTV, um, visible anti-harassment and bullying signs, hotline numbers, posters, um, ensuring that 10% of shops that are created under this project are allocated for women entrepreneurs, right? Looking at the transport agency that's implementing this and saying 15% of that, you know, let's try to ensure that we have female staff in these skilled positions, right? I'm not saying any of this is easy <laughs> at all. I'm not saying we're going to be able to achieve all those things. But really, when we go into looking at an infrastructure project now, it's how can we be holistic in terms of really um, getting to the gender and social inclusion outcomes that we want to see? And also saying we are we are going to measure ourselves to that. And we're going to see where, of course, we will fail. We'll have to learn and where we have a bit more success. Yeah, and I, I think, um, you know, that idea that um, being able to measure that impact is sort of a key part of helping us move to the next step is really important. And that idea of um, you know imagining a future element, I think, is um, a good um, good way to uh, ask Zia this last question, which is, what could be more futuristic than technology and digital? So Zia, how can technology um, and digital solutions? How can we use some of these solutions um, and these tools to improve the planning uh, and the execution and the delivery of more inclusive infrastructure projects? You're just on um, mute, Zed. Sure. Planning, execution, and delivery. I would say I would focus on the planning, and um, you know, I would I would second what Emily is discussing as well. Is that you know I think we need to start looking at how we do projects differently, um, and we need to create convincing um, arguments for them that are backed by data. But the thing is, these actually need to happen quickly and efficiently. So, uh, you know, perhaps with some of the generative de design tools that are coming out that, you know, we can at least get the quick litmus test to say, hey, why don't we actually consider doing this a little differently, take a little time and consider another option. And that's what these generative design tools can do based on emerging, let's say, technologies, emerging designs, which really don't cost much to take out a bend in a, in a tunnel. Um, but, you know, you need to be able to quantify that, you know, perhaps, uh, you know, agility, perhaps, you know, inclusivity and all of that. So I, I would focus on that. All right. And I think that's a, a great way to finish. Um, and unfortunately, that's all we have time for. We will uh, uh, we'll collate all of the questions that we weren't able to answer in this session uh, and maybe look at putting out an answer over our social media channels over the next week or two. But um, thank you to our second panel. Um, that's been absolutely wonderful. Uh, and thanks so much to all of our wonderful panellists uh, for their time and their expertise. Uh, there is obviously still a lot of work to be done, but the quality of the people doing it uh, certainly fills me with optimism. Uh, and thank you to the audience for your part in the conversation. Uh, we couldn't get to as many of the questions as we would have liked, but as I said, we will follow up with you at a later date if we can. Now, there isn't much I can add to what has already been said, but I'll leave you with this thought, uh, that unlike many great human achievements, uh, whether it's great books or great art, infrastructure is never the product of one individual. Uh, instead, it takes hundreds or even thousands of us uh, to imagine and to build. It's a constant physical reminder of our shared humanity. But as we've heard tonight, too often the benefits of infrastructure aren't shared between us all. However, as we've also heard tonight, we have the tools to change that. So let's get started now. Friends and colleagues, wherever you are in the world, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, or good night. Thank you. Thank you, Sam.